Just on an elderly wheelchair bound man rescued from his burning home by San Antonio firefighters. A local nonprofit organization that does COVID-19 tests at dozens of schools is keeping a close eye on different variants popping up across the U.S. Coming up, what they discovered so far. The state of Georgia getting pushed back over its new voting laws. How about the state of Texas? There are bills at the state capitol that could impact businesses and tourism when it comes to San Antonio. And it's only getting hotter outside. Looks like our temperatures will peak later this week. I'll tell you how hot it's going to get, help you prepare. And oak pollen, one of the highest counts so far this season. Talk more about that as well, coming right up. Rotisserie chicken, they're convenient to pick up at the grocery store, but you might be surprised at how much sodium is in some of them. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, a life-saving rescue made by the San Antonio Fire Department on the far south side this afternoon. Yeah, flames reported at a home in the 1500 block of Estancia. That's near Roosevelt Loop 410. San Antonio fire officials say a wheelchair-bound man rescued from inside after firefighters received a call from a concerned neighbor. We knew that we, there's a very good likelihood that the person was still in the house. Uh, crews made the quick attack on the fire, got in there and found that located the individual quickly and were able to uh, take remove the patient, make a rescue out the back. Got him and loaded into the ambulance. The ambulance was on their way quickly. The man was taken to Bamsey for smoke inhalation. No one else was injured. The cause of that fire is being investigated. A new at five, a San Antonio high school teacher arrested in Kendall County after she reportedly assaulted people at a bar in Bernie over the weekend. 48 year old Christy Slavinsky accused of starting fights with several people at Drink Texas. That's the bar that's in Bernie. One person claims Slavinsky threw a bottle at him, which cut his arm. She now faces two counts of assault bodily injury. Slavinsky has been a health teacher at Reagan High School for four years. We reached out to Northside ISD. They tell us she's currently on administrative leave pending an investigation. Two people are facing charges in connection with a crash that killed a man and injured three others last week. It happened along Rigsby Avenue near Comanche County Park. Arrest records state that 24 year old Daniel Tejas was racing his car before he T-boned another car driven by 80 year old Antonio Arismendez Martinez. Martinez died at the scene. Tejas's car was uh, had caught fire. Three passengers inside were injured, including a toddler who was not in a child safety seat. The two year old now partially paralyzed. Her mother, 20 year old Selena Hernandez, now facing charges of endangering a child. Tejas facing a manslaughter charge as well for causing that crash. Just in the daily COVID-19 numbers in Bear County, Metro Health reporting 223 new infections, bringing the total number of cases to 208,172. Two new deaths also reported, bringing that total number to 3,212. 189 patients are hospitalized, 76 are in the ICU, 29 are on ventilators. More than 531,000 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. 323,669 people are fully vaccinated. And this just in Metro Health reporting a total of six cases of the COVID-19 UK variant identified in Bear County. Not only are San Antonio health leaders keeping a close eye on different variants, but so is a local nonprofit. Community Labs says that they have sent out some COVID-19 samples off to a lab to determine if they are possibly that UK variant. Tiffany Huerta spoke to the president of Community Labs about what they have discovered so far. We know our tests can can uh, track all of the original variants. And then we've we've recently heard that the UK variant, uh, the Brazilian variant and the South African variant are all um, covered with our test as well. Sal Weber, president of Community Labs, says last week they sent out a handful of COVID-19 tests to the Department of Health in Austin to determine if those tests are the UK variant. We have sent those off for sequencing to confirm that it actually is the UK variant. Uh, but we, at this point, based on the signature we saw on our test, we do believe we've seen the UK variant. Weber says the samples in question were from the general public and not from schools. He is concerned about a possible fourth COVID-19 surge. Without masks and people maybe are kind of starting to let their guard down, 
um, and, and we're seeing we're seeing more infections. Weber says this week they already saw a significant increase in COVID cases at one local school district. We saw a one particular uh, school district that the week before they had 12 positives and then this week they had 59. Weber says the results of those tests that were sent to Austin last week have not come back yet. Community Labs provides free testing across the city. For a list of those locations, visit KSAT.com. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The idea of state agencies and state funded organizations requiring people to prove that they've been vaccinated against COVID-19 is shut down by Governor Greg Abbott. Today, the governor issued an executive order against state agencies even creating so-called vaccine passports. In a tweet, the governor said in part, quote, Texans shouldn't be required to show proof of vaccination and reveal private health information just to go about their daily lives. Don't tread on our personal freedoms, end quote. Supporters of these passports, mainly businesses, see them as a quicker way for people to get back to their normal routines and protect the workplace. Governor Abbott, the second U.S. governor to ban some uses of vaccine passports. Last week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis made a similar announcement. President Joe Biden announcing today that he has met a major goal on the vaccine front well within his first 100 days of office. The president saying that he made good on his promise with 150 million COVID-19 vaccine shots being administered within his first 75 days in office. But even though there have been more shots, there have also been more new cases. Health and Human Services reporting deaths rising in more than a dozen states. Even so, some states are moving forward with easing their restrictions. California, for example, expecting to fully reopen by mid-June while still leaving its mask mandate in place. It is incumbent upon all of us not to announce mission accomplished, not to put down our guard, but to continue that vigilance that got us where we are today. The White House saying today every American adult will be able to get a COVID-19 vaccine by April 19th. That is two weeks before the original deadline. And today in the Derek Chauvin murder trial, police procedure and policy, the main focus, including a look at what training procedures Chauvin previously underwent and whether the program included the restraint we saw in that now infamous video. ABC's Andrea Fujui has more from New York. During day seven in the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, now the prosecution the showing crisis. records indicating that Chauvin participated in lengthy crisis intervention training sessions. Sergeant Kerr Yang, the department's crisis intervention coordinator, testified that the department's policy is to provide aid when needed. That would be the immediate goal for us. If somebody's in need of medical attention, then we give them medical attention. While the defense focusing on the risk to police officers in certain situations. As a person person is in crisis and the intensity of their own personal crisis grows, you train officers that as they kind of get more intense, the risk to the officer or others is greater. Yes, sir. The prosecution also questioning the department's use of force instructor who offered a training program that Chauvin completed in 2018. He testified that Chauvin's restraint of his knee on Floyd's neck was not a trained department tactic. Using body weight to control. Um, however, I will add that we don't, we tell officers to stay away from the neck when possible. And if you're going to use body weight to pin, to put it on their shoulder and, and be mindful of position. But the defense again pointing to the dangers of the job. In your experience, after a person has been rendered unconscious using a neck restraint, is it possible for them to continue to fight after they come back to consciousness? It is possible, yes. Meanwhile, Maurice Hall, who was in the car with George Floyd that day, appeared via Zoom. While the defense hopes he will testify, Hall's lawyer argued that he should not have to because of criminal charges that could arise from his testimony and because drugs were found in the car he and Floyd were riding in. There will be another hearing on Thursday on whether Hall will testify. Chauvin has pled not guilty to all charges. Andrea Fujii, ABC News, New York. The latest Bear Facts KSAT San Antonio report poll shows a big portion of voters are still undecided on a contentious San Antonio ballot proposition aimed at police reform. Yeah, it's Proposition B, and it would repeal San Antonio police officers' ability to collectively bargain for a new contract with the city. While the poll results show more voters are leaning toward voting against Prop B, 
about 28% are still undecided. A political science professor at St. Mary's Law says many voters are probably unsure about the effects of Prop B, and he thinks its supporters will have a harder time convincing undecided voters. I think that the majority of voters in San Antonio are satisfied with their police and the police services. You know, I think there's a, a dedicated group, 30% more or less, that feel they need some reform, but it's not reform. It's, it's kind of bureaucratic reform. If you're unclear about what Prop B would do, we have an explainer piece on our website, ksat.com. And don't forget this Thursday, the Barifax KSAT San Antonio Report Partnership will host a live stream debate on Prop B between the San Antonio Police Union, Fix SAPD, and a city attorney, the city attorney, will also take part over the impacts of Prop B. I'll be moderating the debate along with Iris Dimmick from the San Antonio Report. You can watch the live stream on KSAT.com Thursday at 7. Head to our website right now to find more ways you can watch that discussion. Now that it's predicted that Texas will be the next battleground state over voting rights, what could that mean for San Antonio? Texas-based companies like Dell Computers and American Airlines have already come out against any proposed legislation that restricts voting rights. Visit San Antonio reporting so far that it has not seen any backlash that could hurt the 15 billion dollar tourism and hospitality industry, which is still recovering from losing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue since the start of the pandemic. That said, now Visit San Antonio says it's having to closely follow what's happening at the state capitol. If we know that it would impact tourism in San Antonio, then yeah, we would get in front of our legislators and let them know and educate them. Coming up at six, we're going to explain the potential impact of Senate Bill 7, which would put limits on how and when ballots are cast and what is required in order to vote absentee. So this weekend we were in the 70s. Yesterday we were near 80. Today, right near 90. I think you see where I'm going with this. Temperatures, of course, on the upswing, and they'll continue to rise through the week. We started the day at 68 and then topped out so far at 89 degrees for the high temperature. 93 though in Del Rio, 90 Eagle Pass, 89 Floresville, even Panamaria Maria at 84, West Kerrville at 87 degrees, Bull Verde now at 86. So we're feeling some warmer temperatures out there and it's only going to get hotter. Not necessarily this evening or tonight, pleasant out there, just a bit breezy, a southeasterly wind at 15 to 20, but mild, 83 at eight o'clock, 10 o'clock, 74, and then get ready for the dry line to pay us a visit. We'll talk about that in storm chances, our oak pollen today, along with the heat coming up. Ursula. Thanks, Adam. Rotisserie chicken, it's tasty and convenient, and at first glance, it seems like a healthy choice. But take a look at the label, and you might find more salt than you bargained for. We compared sodium levels at three stores. What we found is next. Ever picked up one of those warm rotisserie chickens you see in front of the supermarket? Yeah, they're convenient, popular, and the chicken is a healthy protein. But if you're concerned about sodium, you need to check the label. 12 inch size Marilyn Moritz did, and here's what she found. You can almost smell it. Rotisserie chicken ready to eat from the grocery store. They're tasty, convenient, and inexpensive. But you might be surprised to learn what goes into some rotisserie chickens, literally. To keep the birds moist and tasty, they are often injected with a solution. That can include sugar, processed ingredients, and unfortunately, a lot of sodium. Consumer Reports evaluated the nutritional information and ingredients for rotisserie chickens from seven supermarkets and warehouse clubs. Some of the highest sodium levels per serving? Sam's Club, nine times more sodium than a chicken roasted without salt, and about a quarter of what adults should have in a day. Costco's famous rotisserie chickens, not much lower, 460 milligrams. They didn't shop HEB, so we did, checking the labels. We found the sodium content in the original was similar to Costco's, but in the natural rotisserie chicken, it was less, 330 milligrams. We also checked Walmart's. It had a little less than that per serving. But some of the lowest sodium options CR found are Kroger's Simple Truth with just 40 milligrams and Whole Foods Organic and Non-Organic Plain Rotisserie Chicken. Stephanie Pappas has found another healthier choice. She roasts her own. It's so nice and very convenient to have that roasted chicken in the refrigerator that you can just pull out 
put it together some things and, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, you have dinner. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. You roasted your own chicken? Okay, no, but I, I know we needed to know that information. We didn't want to know. But they it. smell so good when you go in the grocery <laughs> store. And they're so inexpensive. Yes. Y'all, roasting your own chicken is actually pretty easy to do, and it tastes really good. I don't know. I watched that story like this. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Nancy, you got to do that on camera. There it. you go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Marilyn, I missed it. I don't want to hear it. And I'm staying off the... Poor uh, Marilyn. Staying off the website so I don't see it. Just trying nice. to help us out here. You heard it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, the reality has set in. So speaking of reality, 90s return tomorrow. The dry line pays us a visit a few times in the days ahead. But I really want to start with our oak pollen and how that spiked today. It is way up there. And I know you don't necessarily need a pollen count to really verify that. You can just step outside and you feel it. Itchy eyes, runny nose. Look at that oak count. 15,100. That is the highest we have seen it yet this season. And actually, uh, usually we see the oak season really peak with numbers like this in late March and then start to taper off into early April. But this year, because of the big freeze that we had in February, it delayed and postponed the peak of our oak season a little bit. So we are actually peaking right now, which is a little bit later than usual. Okay, let's talk temperatures and the reality that's going to be settling in. Lubbock right now at 88, Midland at 92, Abilene currently 91. You look at 92 in Del Rio, that hotter air is going to become much more prevalent across the state in the days ahead. A very diff different map just a few days ago, whereas in a couple of days, we're going to have widespread uh, 90s and even a few 100s, especially south of town. Looking locally now, Catula is 95, so feeling warmer down there. Carrizo Springs 93, so as usual, a little bit warmer farther to the south and southwest of town. But even in the hill country, we have readings well into the 80s. So let's talk about temperatures for tomorrow. We'll start the day well into the 60s, mid to upper 60s for most of us. Then by the afternoon, we creep up into the 90s, I think, even here in San Antonio. We'll get well into the 90s. Catula, Laredo, about 97, 98, Del Rio, 95. Downtown San Antonio, 91, Castroville, 92, along with Elmendorf, Lavernia, 91, and Timberwood Park, pretty close to the 90 degree mark. Then we get into Thursday, and that's when the more intense heat starts to settle in. 95 degrees. By Friday, we're boosting us up to 97. That's record challenging territory on Friday. And then a cool front moves in and basically puts us back into check as we get into the upcoming weekend. So we'll see a drop off from Friday into Saturday, Saturday back down into the mid 80s. So let's talk about our weather pattern and the dry line. I mentioned that's going to be paying us a visit because that will influence our rain chances in the days ahead. Right now, there's a big swirl, upper level swirl here. You see from Casper to Denver that's stirring things up in the northern tier of the US. That's not going to make it here. It's not going to have any direct impact on our weather. What we're focusing on is the West Texas dry line. Look at these dew points. Of course, out ahead of it, 50s and 60s. Behind it, dew points down in the teens. And that dry line is going to be moving our way, it, coming and going, as it often does, over the next couple of days. So right now, dew points are near 60. Let's go through time. Dew points rising tonight. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start the day humid. And then we are anticipating the dry line to drop in for the afternoon. So a good portion of our viewing area, basically along and west of I-35 and even parts of 281 will have a little break in the humidity tomorrow. And that's going to happen in the days ahead, which could trigger some showers and storms on Friday. But that's really our only hope. So 68 in the morning tomorrow, a little over 90 by the afternoon. After some morning clouds, we'll have a lot of sunshine. And then we're well into the 90s on Friday with that slight chance of some late day thunderstorms, some of which could become severe as the dry line pays us another visit. Definitely something you need to keep an eye on. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. All right. Are the Spurs' playoff chances slip sliding away, Greg? Well, yeah, when they play at home, they sure are. Now they're on the road, thank goodness. <laughs> Maybe the best thing for them was to get out of town for a while, which they have. When we come back, we'll show you what happened in their last home game and the reaction by the Spurs. And the Baylor Bears are national champions. Coming up. 
San Antonio Spurs finished their historic nine-game homestand with a 2-7 and seven record that included a lethargic performance against the Cleveland Cavaliers last night before departing on a five-game road trip over just the next seven days. Spurs now stand at ninth in the Western Conference standings. They're 12-17 and 17 at home as a result. The Spurs were hampered by the fact that DeJounte Murray was a late scratch in this game due to a sore right foot. They are already down Lonnie Walker the fourth, who missed his eighth straight game with a sore right wrist. And Trey Lyles down with a sore right ankle. Even with all that, the Spurs got off to a solid start with DeMar DeRozan finding Jakob Pertl. Spins in for the lay-in. The Cavs answer right back. Torian Prince out of Warren High School drains a corner three. He got 10 first half points, and Cleveland leads 28-26 after one. Down 10 at the half. In the second half, Spurs trying to get something going. Lucas Samanich drives hard to the basket. Gets it to fall. Spurs down by 12. Then a little later, Rudy Gay knocks down a three from the wing. But Cleveland finds some separation thanks to Colin Sexton, who scores 10 points in the third quarter alone, and San Antonio falls 125 to 101. It's frustrating. Nobody wants to lose. Um, been uh, exhausting last few games. Um, how we lost tonight, definitely frustrating. Should be frustrating. Um, we got to carry that frustration over and, you know, take it, take it with us on the road and, you know, um, use that frustration as fight to pull out these victories. I think Spurs are in Denver right now. They play tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. For the first time in school history, the Baylor Bears are national champions after knocking off previously undefeated Gonzaga last night in the finals of the NCAA tournament. The Bears led from start to finish with a relentless defense, out shooting the Bulldogs from three-point range. In fact, the Bears made their first five three-pointers to open up an early lead, led by Jared Butler, who finished with 22 points. Right behind him was Macy Oteague, who had 19. The Bulldogs cut the lead to nine in the second half, thanks to Andrew Nemhard's layup. But that's as close as Gonzaga would get. It also marks the first time Baylor has even beaten Gonzaga to hand them their first loss of the season, 86-70 in the national championship. I looked up at halftime, we're up 10. I knew at some point we were up big because I was just like, we're scoring, they're not scoring. And, um, you know, everybody was hitting the shots. It was like nobody's going to miss. But um, it's just electrifying, especially in that type of moment in a big game. And give credit to Baylor, they did great, but at the same time, it looked like Gonzaga left it all on the floor in that <laughs> game against um, uh, UCLA. UCLA, there you go. And, and I'm not surprised Baylor won. I'm surprised they won by, by that, that much. much. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody thought it would be a lot tighter. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Texas narrowly avoided a catastrophic power grid crash during last month's storm. Even so, the storm was devastating for so many people across the state. They have a lot of questions about why the state's power grid was so vulnerable in the first place. It's the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explained. You can watch it tonight at 7 on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app on your streaming device. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News is up next. Coming up at 6 o'clock, we're going to talk to the pollster for the Fairfax KSAT San Antonio report poll. What he has to say are the biggest findings coming up at 6.